Welcome to the Desire to Trade podcast, the podcast helping you develop Forex trading skills for more freedom. I'm your host, Etienne Kite. We are in episode 122 with Jason Levitt. Let's get started right away. Hope you guys are doing fine, and I know the holidays are getting closer and closer as we move into December. I hope you've been able to take action on your goals and that you did something this year to move forward. That's always the goal. And although things will never be exactly as we expected it, there's always something we can do to finish the year strong. And listening to this interview might be a good thing. In this episode, I'm sitting down with Jason Levitt. Jason is a guest that was recommended to me by a listener of the podcast. And I was really happy to interview him and talk about all he's doing. Jason started as a part-time trader, working in a restaurant. Over time, he's been able to trade full-time and then went on to start his own business. Now, this is a perfect example of kind of a progression for traders and really what you have to do if you want to get into the trading and business world as well. So today, you'll be able to get the advice from Jason and feel free to let him know if you like the interview. On that note, we'll jump right in the interview and I'll catch you guys right after. Jason Levitt, welcome on the podcast. How's it going today? Very good. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to have you here. And I was just reading through your site before the interview, when I know we'll have some good things to talk about today. But please just start by introducing yourself and tell people what you're up to these days. Okay, so started trading in the late '90s. Um, been trading and then went full time in 2002. Been trading ever since. Nowadays, I'm trading full time, mostly stocks, some options. I run the Lever Brothers Research Company, which supplies research to hedge funds, individual traders, financial advisors, and such. And besides that, I'm busy with my three kids. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah. Cool. I know a lot of people want to know kind of how you started to trade and how you get involved in trading, but I'm more interested into the how did you transition from kind of part-time to full-time? So maybe go through that uh, phase and tell people how that happened. Okay. So I was, I was lucky in a sense that I went to college, got degrees in engineering, but I spent most of my 20s working in restaurants. And because I worked in restaurants, I had one, I had a flexible work schedule. And two, a lot of the days I would work a night shift and so I could be in front of the market during the day. So unlike some people who have a full-time job and they toy around with trading on the side and they're kind of wondering, how do I go full-time? What do I do? I was actually kind of lucky that like literally from day one, I was a semi full-time trader because you know at least three times a week, I can be in front of the market all day. And then the other two times, I'd have to work a lunch shift. So I didn't have a normal transition from being a beginner to being a full-time trader. It was fairly easy because of my work schedule. At some point in time, I just started cutting back on my work shifts to the point where the last like eight to 10 months, I was only working like once a week on a Saturday night. And eventually the management came to me and said, Hey, look, you're not working enough because you're not working enough. All these other bartenders are, are working overtime. So you either got to work more or you got to go. So I laughed. That was it. But for me, the transition was easy because being a restaurant employee, I could very easily um, you know, trade during the day and then go bartend at night. Mm -hmm. That's pretty interesting. And I guess that was not on purpose. So you kind of had the schedule before and then training came after, right? You know, working in a restaurant is something I did in college. And it's weird. It's like I learned how to bartend. And I was thinking in college, I was thinking, you know what, this is a good skill to have because no matter where I am in life, I can always get a bartending gig at the local mm -hmm. restaurant or something if I need to make some extra money. And then when I started trading, yeah, it was a really, I guess you can call it like more of a coincidence than anything that like, wow, this, you know, I could pursue this and it won't interrupt what I'm doing, you know, to pay the bills. Now, if I had to start over or if I was starting today, I'd probably move to the West Coast where the market opens at 630 in the morning. And then even if you have a full-time job, you can still be in front of the market for the first couple hours. I know a lot of people who do that. They're up. I'm in touch with them in the morning. And then whenever, 8.30, 9, they're like, all right, I got to go. I got to go to work. And they'll go to work, but they've been there for the first two hours of the day. So yeah, my work schedule was very conducive to being a full-time trader. But you know, if I didn't have that work schedule, I'd probably try to move out west in order to be in front of the market for the first couple hours. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I know a lot of people are in that kind of similar situation where they either have a job now and they want to switch to full-time trading. What was that moment when you kind of saw that you could go full-time one day? that you realized that trading was like a full-time career you could have? It wasn't a moment. It, was just, it happened slowly. I would say, you know, it happened, it took like, I'd say two to three years in total before I really 
got comfortable and really started making good money and really started thinking like, hey, I could do this. Now, I believed I could do it from the beginning, but it still took two to three years for it to actually play out. And as I said, like I went from being a full-time restaurant employee where I was working five or six shifts per week and I just cut back, cut back, cut back and to the point where like the last eight or nine, you know, eight to 10 months, I was only working one shift a week. So it wasn't like, boom, I'm done working. It was a very slow transition. And, uh, you know, and that's it. There's not a moment of panic when it officially happens, but there is a, a slight amount of anxiety. Like, wow, this is it. This is, this is official. Like I don't have a side income because at the time I was single, my expenses were really low. If I worked once a week on a Saturday night, I can make 200 bucks. And like, that was almost enough to pay all my bills for the month. So there definitely was a little bit of uh, anxiety, but because the transition happened slowly, it was, I guess it was as smooth as, it, as I could have wanted it to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And from my experience, I think trading with side income is easier than trading without side income. So how did you manage kind of these first month of trading full time? Well, your first point, I absolutely recommend if people want to become a full-time trader, I absolutely recommend having some source of income. You do not want to have to depend on your, on your trading income, like at all, at <laughs> least at the beginning, like you really want to have a side income. You know, we can talk if you want about how having a job actually helped me trading. But like that first month, like for even the first couple of months, it wasn't a big deal because I wasn't going to cut back on my restaurant shifts unless I had enough money in the bank to pay my bills for quite a while. So even if I went full time and had no income on the side, I had enough in the bank that I was fine for a while. So it, there wasn't a whole, it wasn't that scary. It wasn't like I got to make money this month or else I'm doomed. I had a cushion to work with, so which I recommend to everyone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, of course. And how were those like first two or three months after you went full time? Were they kind of easy, like the same thing as before? Or did you have to kind of put new things in place? No, I didn't put new things in place. I think because I transitioned so slowly, mm -hmm. I essentially was a full-time trader because the last eight or 10 months, I only worked Saturday nights. That's all I did is once a week, Saturday night. So I was in front of the market you know, Monday through Friday um, all day. So I was already living the life of a full-time trader. So there were no major breaks. There were no, holy cow, this is real. That's happening. I got to circle the wagons and figure out what to do. It, like I was already basically full-time with a little bit of side income on the, you know, on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like the idea that you took it kind of progressively, that you built things over time. I'm curious to know what were the things that you had to kind of work on or put in place in those first two or three years before going full time? Are there like some things you really had to work on more than others? Well, I'll tell you this, is that working in a restaurant where sometimes I worked a lunch shift and sometimes I didn't work a lunch shift, it provided me two very distinct environments that I traded under. One environment was I'd wake up in the morning, I'd be in front of the computer for Make maybe the first half hour a little bit longer, and then I was gone the rest of the day because I had to work a lunch shift. And then the second environment that I worked in was I'd wake up and I'd be in front of the market all day long. So I had two very distinct situations that I traded under. And I realized over time that I actually made more money when I worked a lunch shift at the restaurant than I did when I was in front of my computer all the time. And that was probably the biggest eye opener to me. And it was the biggest adjustment I had to make early on because when I worked at the restaurant, I restricted myself to only trading the very best setups because I knew I wasn't going to be there. Okay. So I would narrow my list, narrow it down, narrow it down, narrow it down to like only the one or two absolute best setups. Okay. So I'd never traded the good ones. I sometimes traded the really good ones, but I tried my best to, I had to, I had to restrict myself to only trading like truly, truly, truly great setups. And I traded them somewhat mechanically. The market would open, I'd place orders, I'd put stops in place, and then I'd have to go. And this is like early 2000s where you didn't have cell phones where you can check stock quotes. I would have no idea what would go on until I got home, sometimes at midnight. And then you compare that to when I wasn't working a lunch shift and I can be in front of the computer all the time, I traded like higher beta stocks. I traded stocks that had more volatility. I traded stocks that had a lot more risk. I tended not to plan as much because I figured, hey, I'm going to be in front of the market anyways. I'll see what's going on. I could just figure it out. And I tended not to use stops either because I figured, well, I'm watching it. If I need to get out, I can just get out. And what I realized is like I was my own worst enemy. There were times when I worked a lunch shift where I would get into a position, put a stop in place. I'd come back later that night and I'd say, okay, nice. I bought it at 60. It's now at 60.75. 
But I'd look at the interday chart and I'd see that during the day, it actually dipped back down and then back up. And I look at that and I'm like, wow, if I was in front of the computer all day, I probably would have gotten scared out during that dip. But because I just put a stop in place and let it go, I'm sitting on a profit and so far the chart looks good and I'm just going to stay in. So I realized over time that I actually made more money when I was not in front of my computer than when I was in front of my computer. Okay, so that was the biggest adjustment I had to make as I got closer and closer to going full time and I was working less and less at the restaurant. I had to force myself to trade as if I was working at the restaurant. Okay, does that make sense? Because if I entered every day without a plan in place, thinking I could wing it, I'm going to trade high you know, risk stocks because they move more. I didn't do as well as when I traded safer plays under better conditions and traded them somewhat mechanically. So that was the biggest adjustment I had to make. And it's something I sometimes ask myself today. Sometimes I'll, I'll say like, okay, let's pretend you can only be in front of the market for the first hour of the day. What would you do? And oftentimes that's a better answer than, well, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. We'll just see what's going to happen tomorrow. Okay. So I, th- I think that answers your question. That was the biggest transition or adjustment I had to make as I went close to full time is that even though I could be in front of the computer all the time, since I did better when I wasn't in front of my computer, sometimes I would have to act as if I wasn't there. I'd have to say like, okay, if you couldn't be in front of the market tomorrow, what would you do? What's the one stock that you would trade if you weren't going to be in front of the computer? Or I'd look at a stock and say, would you be comfortable placing an order and then leaving for the rest of the day? Those are questions I still ask myself today just because I want to restrict myself to only trading the very best setups rather than the ones that are just pretty good. Okay. So again, that's the biggest adjustment I had to make. It was an adjustment I made while I was still working because again, the, like, like those last eight or 10 months, I only worked like a Saturday night. So that was the biggest adjustment I had to make as I went full time is that more time in front of the computer didn't necessarily mean more profits. In fact, it was the opposite. So even though I'm full time and even though I I could be in front of the computer all the time, I sometimes restrict myself because I actually do better when I step away. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big lesson and it's pretty much the same for me. So I've been doing something very similar. Now, I was going to ask, is this something you still do today or do you have some ways to kind of manage the trade when it's open? When I'm not sure what to do, I do pose the situation to myself. I'll ask myself, like, what if you couldn't be here tomorrow? What if you could only be here for the first 30 minutes a day? What would you do? Would you trade this stock? if you could only access the market once during the day. And sometimes, and and if I really like the stock, then the answer is yes. If the stock is so-so, then the answer often is no. So now I run an advisory service, a research company, and the website has a message board. So I'm in touch with people on the message board. So because of that, even though I personally won't be looking for a trade, or I'm trying to put stops in place and just let them go and not tinker with them, I'm still in front of my computer most of the day because I'm running a research company. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you don't have to look at the chart, which is kind of good. And that's kind of the power of having multiple occupations or multiple kind of jobs. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, for those who have jobs and want to trade full time, I mean, my experience was I did better when I had a job. I'm sure maybe part of it was because you had income on the side. So there was less stress. But I think a lot of it was because I was my own worst enemy. And in order for me to not be my own worst enemy, it was better for me to take a step back. It was better for me to look at a chart, get in, put a stop in place, and then just step away from the market and let the market do the rest of the work. Because if I was in front of the computer all day looking at the five-minute chart, like I could get scared out at any given time. And I realized over time that I'm my own worst enemy. And the only way for me to solve that issue is to just take a step back and just let the market do its thing. Mm-hmm. And that also shows that you have kind of a review process at that point that was fairly good because you could go back and reevaluate how you perform. Yeah. I, I mean, I, it, it was a very incidental, I guess, coincidental benefit to working in a restaurant lunch shifts part time is that half the time I was in front of the computer, half the time I wasn't. So I could look at the two sets of data and mm-hmm. say like, wow, I make more money under this situation than under this other situation. So you know, which, which is something that all traders, all traders need to do. All traders, I mean, my situation was whether I was in front of the computer or not, other traders, you have to keep track of what you do. You have to journal it. What kind of trades are you taking? What time frames are you using? What indicators are you using? You're going to take notes. When do you make money? When do you not make money? And then over time, you're going to do more of what works and do less of what doesn't work. And you're going to kind of iterate your way to finding your, you know, your, your, what I call your sweet spot. 
Okay. So like everyone does that in some fashion in order to find out when, you know, under what circumstances they make money and then and under what circumstances they, they tend not to make money. And then, like I said, do more of what work, what's working and less of what's not working. Absolutely. And how do you keep track of all that? Was it like a spreadsheet or? More notes. Like I wasn't organized enough to have an official spreadsheet. But it was more like anecdotal notes that like, hey, I got into this position at 60, I put a stop in place and I just let it go and look, look, now it's at 64, it's doing well. This other stock I got in at X and I got spooked out over here and I made 50 cents, but the stock went up five bucks. And I kept, you know, and like over time, you just realize that like, gee, putting a stop in place and just letting it go is working a lot better than thinking that I could manage a trade intraday which more times than not led to me getting out too early or too late. Mm -hmm. Now, these days you're managing both day trading or kind of lower time from trading and then higher time from trading. So how does that, how do you combine the two? How do you trade on both styles? Well, for the shorter term, I'm just looking for a stock that seems to have a buildup of pressure and that's going to like pop. I've heard some people say they're looking for stocks that are pregnant and they want it to, you know, just pop. And it's just, you're just looking for a quick move. Okay. You're looking for, like I said, a buildup of pressure and then it's going to pop. It's going to go a couple points, but maybe the overall chart isn't that great. So you don't really have a good reason to hold longer term, but in the short term, you could definitely see a trade playing out. There's a lot of stocks that will move five or 10% in a relatively short period of time and then shift into some sort of range that'll last a couple months. So I'm only looking to make a quick pop for longer term ones. I want a strong stock and a strong group. Often there's like an underlying theme that's in place that the group will ride. And if I look back, if I stand back and look at say the weekly chart with a couple key moving averages and I say, wow, this thing is like steadily moving up above some key moving averages. Maybe it trends, then move sideways and trends and move sideways. When I stand back and see the big picture, if I think like, wow, this has the potential to be a three or four or five month hold, then that's a different type of trade. So to me, every time I look at a chart, I'll ask myself, is this just, am I getting in just for a quick move? Or does this look like a chart that, hey, this trend is, you know, there's a trend in place and it can last for uh, several months. Now, as far as playing them both, I'm literally just talking to myself before I enter. Before I get in, I'm telling myself, look, this is a long-term trade. I'm going to give it time and space to play out. I'm going to put a stop here. I want to give it every opportunity to completely play out and I'm going to let it go. I'm not going to micromanage it. For a shorter term trade, literally before I enter, I will tell myself, this is a short term trade. I'm only looking for a quick pop. I don't have much room for error here. It either works or it doesn't, period. Okay. So what you don't want to do is turn one into another. You don't want to, <clears throat> you don't want to have a, a longer term trade, a potentially longer term trade turn into a short term trade because you get out too early. And of course, you don't want to have a short-term trade turn into a long-term trade because it goes against you and you figure, well, I'm just going to hold on to it. So before I enter any trade, I clearly state to myself, this is a longer-term trade, this is a shorter-term trade, and stick with that. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. And I see that there's a lot more context in the longer-term trade than the shorter-term trade, right? More context, did yeah, you say? So, yeah. And what do you mean by context? So you're looking more at the big picture and like different oh, yeah, yeah. Like industries. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I want I want a strong stock, I want a strong group, I want a nice trend, I want moving averages moving up. The charts tend to move smoothly and gracefully. For a shorter term, yeah, it could be a stock that's within a range and I'll play from like the bottom of the range to the top of the range or maybe from the middle of the range to the top of the range. There's typically is going to be a, a resistance level up above that I'm not going to assume is going to be taken out. So yeah, there's definitely less to look at. There's definitely just a buildup of pressure and boom, you're looking for a quick move that only lasts a few days or a week, maybe even two weeks at most. But the bigger picture might not look as good. Mm -hmm. Did your trading style change or kind of adapt over time or has it always been the same way? The bigger picture on how I trade has mostly been the same, but I've definitely refined things. You know, once I honed in, once I figured out how to make money, which is like, I want a strong stock. I want a strong trend. I want momentum. That's basically stayed the same. After that, it just has become refining entries, trying to hold longer when stocks are doing well, trying not to trade in and out as much, although I still do. But overall, like what I found is that if you get the big picture right, okay, the big picture meaning, hey, there's a strong trend, there's a lot of momentum, 
the market is very healthy. If you get that right, then whether you trade candlestick patterns or chart patterns or certain technical indicators or whether you buy a breakout within a pattern or whether you buy a dip to a certain moving average, like those minor details don't matter that much compared to do you get the trend right and are you on the right side of the trend. So I've always tried to just ride a trend. And then within the trend, I'm just like playing breakouts and buying dips to moving averages and, and stuff like that. Those little things I've tinkered with over the years as far as how to get into a stock. But the big picture, which is I want to ride a trend, has stayed the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to discuss a little bit, uh, leave it broader. So your website. I know this is a website that you kind of wish you had when you started to trade and you, when you were learning to trade. So how did the motivation come to create that site? Well, in my early days, I was all in. I was completely all in, totally immersed, you know, lost touch with a lot of my friends. I, I went all in. I, wa I wanted to become a trader. And if that meant working 20 hours a day, then I was going to work 20 hours a day. If I was working at the restaurant, I, I would I'd be in front of the market beforehand. I'd go to work. I'd come home and I'd be in front of my computer till two, three in the morning. If I wasn't working that day, I could, I could literally work through the bell into the night and into like well past midnight, maybe take a break to go to the gym. So I did that for like two to three years. And at some point when I started, when I started getting pretty good, I wanted to work less hours. Okay. So I was looking around for like, there's got to be a service out there. There's got to be like a stock picking service out there that I could just subscribe to that will give me picks. So instead of me flipping through charts, flipping through a thousand charts every single night, trying to find a couple of good plays for the next day, maybe there's a service out there that can supply me with those and I could save myself some time. So I looked around and I just didn't see much. So that's where I got the idea. I wondered, you know, there's got to be some other people out there like me who like either don't want to do the research, don't know how to do the research, don't have time to do the research, and maybe they'd be willing to s a modest monthly fee in order to have somebody essentially do all that grunt work for them and say, here you go. These are the tests. These are the best 10 or 15 setups for the week. So I kind of started the business that I wish was out there, but I couldn't find. Okay, It was kind of like a scratch your own itch type of business. So I figured that like, that's what I wanted. So I figured maybe there's some other people out there who wanted it. So that's how I started. I started because it was the business I wanted to subscribe to myself. And that's it. And does that require you to do all the picking for every stock or is it like automated now? So I write a weekly report, which talks about the big picture, the trends, the staying power, the trends. I write a daily report Monday through Thursday after the close, which also talks about the trends, but then digs a little bit deeper in, into the day-to-day -day happenings that are going on, whatever's important, things I notice, things I see, warnings that might be there or support that I might see there. It, it operates more detail than the weekly chart. And then the, the trading ideas. So I go through the market every week. I look at anywhere from 500 to 1,000 charts. I have scans that I run. I pull out what I consider to be the best stocks every week. Sometimes there are 10, sometimes there's 15. And I post those. And I post those in chart form with, with recommended uh, you know, entries and exits. And I describe what I see. And you know, so that's what I do. Most of my subscribers are individual traders or hedge funds or financial advisors. And yeah, I, that's, that's, that's what the service is. It's, it's, it's a weekly and daily report. And then probably 10 to 15, sometimes a few more, sometimes a few less trading ideas for the week, the ones that I consider to be the best and have the highest potential. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know, and this is totally off script, but is that process of writing a newsletter and looking at the, the stocks and everything, is that helping you trade better over time? It does, because there are times where I'll look at a chart or I'll look at the market And then, and I'll have one kind of opinion of it, but then forcing myself to articulate those ideas and knowing that a lot of people are going to read those ideas causes me to maybe think twice or maybe it just doesn't sound right. Or am I really sure about this? So yeah, instead of winging it, it actually forces me to articulate things. And sometimes by articulating them, I do, you know, change my mind. You know, I think the market is doing one thing, but then after I go through the charts and actually describe what I see... I kind of come to the conclusion that, huh, maybe my initial gut instinct wasn't correct. You know, and then so by going through and writing the reports, it does help clarify things in my mind. And sometimes it ends up forcing me to change my mind. Mm -hmm. And this is something I've noticed for myself, like when I started to teach people, definitely like became a better trader myself just by teaching and helping others. So absolutely. Absolutely. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you would like to maybe add or anything that people have to know or learn? Absolutely. I'll add in one thing. Um, so we talked about a little bit my journey. We talked about how I worked in the restaurant and how I traded better under one circumstance to the other. If somebody wants to be a full-time trader, I'll kind of sum it up like this. There are three bullet points that I tell people. 
One is you got to find what I call your sweet spot. Okay. Two, you got to practice it and get really good at it. And three, you have to size up. So if I go through each one of those, there's so many different ways to trade. There's so many products where between stocks and options and futures, and you can trade domestically, you can trade foreign stuff, you can trade ETFs. There's like literally un, you know, in currencies, there's dozens and dozens of products out there to trade. Of course, there's like many, many timeframes. There are you know, hundreds of indicators and those indicators can be could be placed on any time frame chart. You can change the parameters of the indicators. There's literally, when you mix and match different time frame, different, different products, different indicators, there's literally unlimited number of ways to trade. And number one key is to find what I call your sweet spot. Like find the one thing that works for you. Okay. That takes time. Okay. The, you, the, the great thing about trading, like say, unlike say, say playing baseball, where you have to be moderately good at hitting all pitches, because what if you have two strikes and the pitcher throws, you know, the pitcher throws you a strike, you have to swing at it. Trading allows you, as hard as it is, trading allows you to pick one thing that you're really good at and just do that. And you're allowed to just ignore everything else. And so the first goal of anyone who's trying to learn how to trade or pursuing trading is to find that one thing, find something that works, something that kind of jives with your personality, something that you can execute, find what that one thing is. It's going to take time. It could take six months. It could take a year. You're going to have to ex experiment with different trading styles, different stuff, but find your sweet spot, find that one trade that works and you can execute. And then after that, you got to practice. Okay. This is a performance activity. You got to practice. You got to get good at it. No different than if you, you know, wanted to be a baseball player, or a golfer or a writer or anything. It's, it's a performance activity and you got to practice it. And by practicing, you're going to get better and you're going to make little changes to what you're doing. And then once you get pretty good at it, then the last thing is you got to be able to size up. Okay. You could stop there and just practice, get good and just do it over and over. You can make a living doing that. But if you want to truly make good money, you're going to at some point have to be comfortable sizing up. Okay. We've all taken a lot of trades. And at the end of six months, we look back and say, man, if I would have just taken a much bigger position on that one, I would have been much better off than I am right now. Okay. So those are the steps that I would advise people to kind of somewhat follow is number one, find your sweet spot, find that one trade that, you, that works and that you could execute. Once you figure that out, practice it. Okay. Practice it. Every losing trade is like a basketball player missing a shot. It's, it's not a big deal. It's just you, you gather information, you get feedback, you make slight adjustments, and then you do it again. Okay. So find your sweet spot, practice it and get good. And then when appropriate, selectively size up when you have the chance. I think that's powerful advice, really, really powerful. And that's kind of a whole process in itself. Might take some time for people to get through the three parts, but uh, yeah, definitely powerful. Yeah, it'll take a couple of years. You can spend an entire year just tinkering around with different trading styles. Do you want to buy dips? Do you want to play breakouts? Do you want to play this indicator? Okay, you want to play this indicator? Do you want to do it a shorter term time frame? Do you want to do a longer term time frame? What will your personality allow you to do? If you get into a stock and it goes against you a little bit, do you find yourself freaking out or are you pretty calm about it? You got to get in the market. You got to try things out. You got to see what works. You got to see what works for you. Yeah, you know, that could take like a whole year. And then once you figured it out, then you got to practice. Like I said, you got to practice, you got to practice. And even after you get pretty good, you're probably going to have to continue honing your skills because you're probably going to get pretty good under one market type. And then when the market changes, you'll have to, you'll have to tinker around a little bit, you know, like a lot, like right now the market's trending up, it's been trending up for a while. So there's some traders out there who have no idea what it's like to trade in a flat market or a down market. So right now they think they're really good and they are really good. Okay. But when the market changes, they're going to have to make some changes. So yeah, it's a, probably a two to three year process if I was being honest. And then even after that, there are slight changes that need to be made when the market actually make, makes changes too. Exactly. And that's, that's powerful. And how do you know kind of when to make a change? Because this is something I went through kind of recently myself, but I'm, I'm just curious for your, your part. Are you talking about like when the market changes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, to me, my own trading success is the best indicator I have. If the market's trending up and I'm buying dips and I'm playing breakouts and things are generally working, then I'm going to keep doing them. If I realize that, you know, I've just had three out of four bad trades or four out of five losing trades, then that's when I realize that like, okay, the market has changed because I'm doing the same thing, but I just lost money on three or four trades. So obviously the market has changed. So that's, that's my number one indicator is 
Like, how's my own trading doing? And if what I'm doing doesn't continue to work, then obviously the market has changed. And when it changes, you got to go to cash if you're a shorter term trader and reevaluate things and come up with a slightly different game plan. Like for example, when if the market is trending up, you might be in the habit of holding a little bit longer because you want to milk trades for everything they're worth. But if the market settles into a range or a trade sideways for several months, instead of shooting for 15 or 20% gains, you might only be able to shoot for 5 or 10% gains at most. Okay, so those are the slight adjustments I would make. Maybe instead of chasing a breakout, which would work fine if the market was super strong. Maybe you have to be more, you know, maybe you have to do more dip buying instead so that you, you can have stops that are closer. Okay. And, and again, like I just said, like maybe you have to, you know, take profits at 5% instead of letting them run. So those are the little changes that you have to make as the market changes. Mm -hmm. Cool. So how can people find you if they want to connect with you or reach out after the podcast? The best way to get in touch with me is through email. My email address is jason at levittbrothers.com. They can go to, to either levittbrothers.net or levittbrothers.com and email me through the sites. I'm on Twitter, but I don't do much there. My Twitter account is at Jason Levitt. Those are the best ways to get in touch with me. And what kind of goals do you have for the future? I'm going to keep, you know, with trading, I'm going to keep going. With the website, I'm going to keep going. With the service, I'm toying around with possibly writing a book. I've been starting to throw some notes together. So I have to see. Uh, writing a book, there's so many reasons to write it. You know, a book, unlike say a, a random blog post, which just kind of gets, has a very short shelf life and just kind of gets lost in cyberspace after it's posted. A book could have pretty long shelf life. A lot of my favorite books like were written, you know, decades ago. And so there's, there's a draw to writing a book that you can put it out there. And, you know, in 10 years from now, somebody could read it and learn something from it. And it, that could change the life. Who knows? The flip side is that writing a book is a massive amount of work. So we'll see. I'm toying around with it. We'll see. So that, that, might, be, uh, that might be something I'm, I'm going to be working more on in the future. But otherwise, it's, you know, I have three kids. They keep me busy. So it's kind of hard to have, pers it's hard to have personal... Outside of running a, a research company and my own trading, it's kind of hard to have a lot of personal goals when you have three kids that are really busy. Right. And speaking of books, do you have any books that you would like to recommend people to read? So my favorite book was written back in the 80s. It's called Stan Weinstein's yeah. Secrets for Profiting in Bull and Bear Markets. That's a book I've read numerous times. It's still the first book that I read, or not read, it's still the first book I recommend to anyone who asks. It's a really good nuts and bolts book. The other books are like similar to what others, have, others probably say, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator is a great book. All the Market Wizards books are at the top of the list. A lot of nuggets in there. My favorite book that's not about trading, but definitely applies to trading is a book is a book called The Score Takes Care of Itself. It was written by Bill Walsh. He was a coach for the San Francisco 49ers. It's more of a book about leadership, but when you're trading, you're trading on your own and you're the boss. So I think there's a lot of technique. There's a lot of nuggets in the book and how he runs an organization that you could use as, you know, if you consider your own trading activity to be a business and an organization, there's a lot of things in that book that, that have helped me. But those are the main ones. The, the big one is Stan Weinstein's Secrets for Profiting in Bull and Bear Markets. That's still my favorite after, after all these years. I think you're the first to mention that book on the podcast. And it's also one of my favorite books that I read like a while back. And I still have it read it a couple of times. So really awesome. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And what's your main motivation for running your, uh, your, your firm and doing all these things? Uh, the motivation now is, uh, you know, I can help people out and make, make side income. That's pretty much it. You know, I went full time. It's great to have a side income. I could certainly live off my, uh, off my trading profits, but to have a side income helps relax a little bit. Helps, you know, because tra trading could be sporadic. As a mostly a swing trader, you can have really good months and then you can have flat months mm -hmm. and you run a service on the side, which is a pretty good extension of what I'm already doing. It's a steadier flow of income. So that, that's my motivation is like I can help people out. I've been in business for 15 years. I have a lot of people, probably over a, over 100 people who have been there almost since day one or for at least 10 years. So that's, that's dual motivation is to make a little bit of money on the side and uh, just help people out. Mm -hmm. And I have this one question I ask all my guests at the end of every podcast. If you could give only one piece of advice for traders in one sentence, what would that one sentence of advice be? One piece of advice is find... My extended sentence would be what I just described a second ago is find your sweet spot, practice and get really good at it, and then selectively size up. Style drift is a big problem with traders. They jump from one trading style to the next to the next. And six months later, they realize if they would have just stuck with their first trading style, it would have worked just fine. 
get out of that habit, find your sweet spot, find that one trade that works for you and then practice it and get really good at it. Okay. You know, Ted Williams used to say, you tell, you give me 10 great hitter, you show me 10 great hitters and I'll show you 10 different hitting styles. And I could say the same thing about traders. Like you show me 10 great traders and they all trade differently. So find that, you know, focus on being great at one thing and ignore everything else. I think that's more than one sentence. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. So wonderful. Jason Levitt, thanks so much for being on the podcast. It's been a pleasure to be here. You're welcome. I'm glad, happy to be here. Awesome. So I hope this has been of value to you and I hope you could take some things to apply. Sometimes we listen to podcasts only for inspiration, sometimes more to learn and apply things. Whatever works in your situation, I'm happy to provide these interviews. And I don't talk about it often, but we have an amazing academy on the side of the podcast where you can learn from traders. I put my content there. I try to be as supportive as I can. If you want to learn more about this, you can check it out and apply. All the details are at desartotrade.com forward slash academy. I'll say it right away, this is not for everyone, but if you are serious about it, go check it out. Desartotrade.com forward slash academy. And I would love to be able to help you there more as we go into 2018 and forward. Thanks for tuning in today. I appreciate it a lot. I'll catch you guys next week for the next episode of the Desire to Trade podcast. Ciao.